Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, across the studio screen is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm exceptionally well. How does this day find you, Rory? Um, tired. Um, because the next door neighbours decided to have a karaoke party till four o'clock in the morning. Always so. <laughs> good to check in on self, isn't it? And we're just so yes. grateful that you tuned in to the Counselling Tutor podcast. This is episode 155. We have three topics that we're going to be covering today. We're going to be starting off with going into counselling training when you have a difficult past. We're then going to move on to our check-in uh, with our good friends at CPCAB, uh, where Rory, you had a chat with uh, Molly Air, and you were speaking about blended learning. Absolutely, and uh, I think that what we're seeing from Molly's interview is a is a little peek of what training to be a counsellor may look like in the future. Very exciting. Looking forward to that one, and I think blended learning is a good topic, no matter where you are in your study journey. And I mean, even if you're a qualified practitioner, we engage in con continuing professional development, and blended learning a really important aspect of that. And we'll be ending uh, episode one five five with our practice matters section, where we kind of look at things that might arise in the practice of being a counsellor or psychotherapist. And we're going to be talking about handling abusive phone calls. So stick around for that one. But let's start off with training with a difficult past, Rory. Yes. Um, I mean, at the time the podcast is broadcast, um, there'll be a lot of people will be applying for places on courses. They'll be looking at progression. And every year I get letters in the mailbag asking is it okay to become a counsellor if you've had counselling yourself or you've had maybe a difficult past and the answer to that is yes of course it is I mean a majority of people come to counselling because of their own experience you know either being in, in, th in therapy um, or, or having difficult uh, times where they want to help others um, but there are a few things that you do need to consider uh, because counselling training is a very emotional journey and uh, we need to be we need to be relatively robust to be able to engage in it. So I thought this would be a really good topic today to talk about. And if there's anybody out there that is a bit concerned or a bit reticent about applying for a, you know a counselling course, this may be of service to you. Hundred percent. And I, I, I recognise that if if you had to get a, a room full of qualified therapists and and have a quick question and answer session to say what 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 made you decide to become a counsellor very very often you're going to hear a story of an experience or a road that they walked themselves and and in walking that road uh, developed a desire to be there for other people because counselling is very much a selfless profession in that we are there in service of clients um, and uh, I, I guess I can relate to that from my from my own road. There were, there were parts of my road that were particularly dark, uh, extremely difficult. There were times I thought that I couldn't go on. And it was from the shining lights that were the people that were there for me that kind of got me through that and, and created that that want within me to, to do the same, to, to be a guiding light for others. And I, I can certainly recognize having those questions in myself of will the past that I have lived influence my studies or my ability to be to be a, a counsellor? Yes, and and I think you're you're not although your experience is unique, Ken, is is not an unusual place for people to be as a as someone who's been a trainee, someone who's been a tutor. This this comes up a lot, and it comes up a lot in our Facebook page, which is why. Um, I've decided we decided to have this topic today. If you don't know about our Facebook page, go to Facebook, type in Counseling Tutor, you'll find our page. Um, just knock on the door, we'll let you in, and you join thousands of like minded people all interested in the world of counseling and psychotherapy. We have students, we have qualified colleagues, um, supervisors, and a soupçon of trainers all there to help you on your journey. And this topic has come up a lot. Um, recently and it's not surprising because it's about this time of year at the time of the broadcast that people will be thinking you know will a difficult past hold me back there, there are some things that you need to consider and one of the things that 
trainers talk about is hidden clients where people will come for training where really they need their own therapy. And there have been cases where I've interviewed someone and quite clearly they were unwell. They were really unwell and they, they needed some therapeutic support and they thought that actually coming to train as a counsellor may be more helpful. And I have to tell you, that isn't the case. It probably does more harm than good. So I think it's if you have got difficulties, tell your tutor because it will come out. Here's the thing. If you don't tell your tutor, when the emotional temperature starts to rise um, during training, it will come out and then tutors will have to take a view and, and, and try and support you. I would say tell your tutor and tell them what support you have. And, you know, there are some times where, where people are so unwell that really counselling training would, would, just, would just not help them at all. In fact, it may, may make things worse. So tell, you, tell your tutor what's going on for you and trust your tutor's judgment or observation to, to help you along there. But don't be put off is what I'm saying. Um, I've trained lots of people. I can think of one person who's now a personal friend of mine seven or eight years down the road who had just a, 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 a really, really traumatic past. And this particular person now is, is a top-flying therapist. She's brilliant. And she still has to work on her difficulties every day, but she doesn't, that doesn't interfere the service she gives to a client. So I guess it's a heartfelt plea. You know, don't let the past hold you back. 100%. And I, I just want to echo what you've said there, Rory, in that counselling training is not therapy. And I, I guess, yes, of course, when you look back on your training post-graduation, you may see such growth there and elements of it, of your training that were therapeutic. But that's not the reason you are there. You are there uh, to learn how to be in service uh, uh, of others. Uh, and part of that journey is learning about yourself. It's about looking in the crevices, in the dark places that I guess we don't normally want to look in. We're called upon to look in those areas uh, during our training. Um, and, and Rory, you're speaking about the, the difficult past in, in terms of what you may have experienced uh, psychologically emotional in your past but there's another side to this as well something that that also shows at this time of year where people are looking to go into courses questions like you know what I've had a difficult past I have a criminal record now because of the things the situations I found myself in the things that I did would that stop me from from going into training and becoming a counsellor absolutely and uh, I think that this is this is a case of being honest it comes out you know, that this is the whole thing. It, it, it does come out. If it's a difficult emotional path that you've had, um, then as the training increases, it's more likely that, that, that you'll become unpacked. Uh, I've seen that in my own teaching practice where people have become unpacked in therapy and the, the, in, in training, and they've really needed a different form of support. And also, you know, if you have got, a, you know, a, a criminal record, um, again, declare that at the interview. Um, you know, it doesn't debar people. There, there, clearly, there are certain crimes that you, you couldn't become a counsellor with because you wouldn't be able to get a CRB check. But I think it's a case of being honest and, and trusting in your tutor to take a take a view on that. But it shouldn't hold you back. And I made a, a, a handout, the, the famous super duper handout, and um, and I'm just going to I'm just going to write some points you might like to think about on that, um, and and maybe just give some overview of the kind of situations or the kind of presentations that people have brought to me as a trainer and said I'm really worried about this and the kind of questions you may get asked by your tutor um, for, for your tutor to try and work out are, are you going to be safe and this is all about safety you know nobody wants someone on a course who's, who's going to become ill or, or, or become you know have a nervous breakdown in training, no one wants that. And part of part of a tutor's job is to assess, you know, the emotional kind of robustness of, of any student coming through the door. Um, but honesty is the best policy, I think. Mm. And as you said, Rory, it tends to unravel. Stories tend to come out as you go down the path. Just going back to the the, the question of a criminal record, um, when, when you go to, to join a, an ethical body, a professional organisation, it's going to be one of the questions that is asked on entrance 
to, to that organization. The last thing you want is to have spent three years of your life studying to, to maybe get into a situation where you're not able to join an ethical body. It's that honesty being the best policy right at the very start. And one of the things we're called up upon uh, in counseling uh, training is, is to exercise a muscle uh, that, that is so dormant in so many so often, and that is our courage muscle. Um, and it, it's good practice to exercise that right from the very beginning. You know, it, it's not easy to speak to somebody uh, maybe that you don't know at an interview process for a new counselling course and, and start going into parts of your life. Uh, it takes courage, but becoming a counsellor takes courage. The clients that will one day come and see you, uh, it takes them courage to come and see you. So courage is part of being a counsellor. So I echo what Rory has said and start as you mean to continue with that courage and being honest and truthful uh, about what where you have been and what that road has looked like uh, for you because you're in good hands a tutor is only there for the for your best interest and the best interest I guess of of the profession of counseling psychotherapy and the clients you will one day see at the end of the day Rory mentioned his super duper handout if you want to get that it is so easy all you do is go to our website which is counselingtutor.com uh, right in the top of a menu bar you're going to find a little tab that says podcasts click on that it's going to take you through to our back catalog catalog of podcasts uh, click on episode 155 that's today's episode 155 you'll find our show notes from our discussion today with any ex uh, links that are relevant to what we've spoken about and right there on that page you can download Rory's super duper handout free of charge you just put in your name your email address and we will send that right uh, through for you yeah, and if you are a student who's currently in training and struggling i would say don't struggle don't feel alone don't become unwell speak to your tutor and and get some get some support so i think a lot of a lot of students are sometimes quite nervous about talking about stuff that's going on for them in case they get they get removed from the course that shouldn't be the case first instinct of a tutor should be to look at how they can support you in your training and uh, and how they can how they can help you um get to your, get to your learning goals 100 percent. and you know we speak about support in uh, counseling training it leads us beautifully onto our next topic this section is called check in with cpcab cpcab are a um a body that kind of looks after the training they're they're, they're not the only one but they're certainly um the largest here in the uk uh, run by counsellors in service of counsellors and, and their organisation is about support and wh when you're on a counselling course there's there's a lot of new theories, uh, there's, there's a lot of work, there's assignment work and we have to recognise that different people learn in different kinds of ways and there is a term that is discussed in our check-in with the CPCAB and that's blended learning Rory. Yes absolutely and, and you, you're absolutely right and of course, the, the the COVID epidemic that at the time of broadcasting this podcast is still is still with us, has altered the way that counselling training is delivered. And uh, we're speaking with Molly Ayer. She's a new presenter from CPCAB, and she overviews what counselling training may look like in the future, um, in a digital age. So, uh, so I I suggest if you're thinking of going into training, this is a must listen to section because you're going to get a, a real clear view of what the future of counselling training is going to look like by CPCAB, who are a very forward-thinking awarding body. Let's check in with CPCAB. Check in with CPCAB. And we welcome Molly Ayres today, or Molly Ayr, should I say, um, to the podcast. Uh, Molly, just tell me a little bit about your role at CPCAB. Hi Rory, it's nice to be with you today. Yeah, I'm one of the qualification uh, professionals at CPCAB and my role um, certainly over the last few months during lockdown has been to um, develop some resources to help centres and students adapt to remote teaching and learning during these really difficult, extraordinary times. Yes, and the, these are extraordinary times. And for those of you who are listening and wondering what the extraordinary times are, maybe you're listening um, way in the future. We're, of course, talking about the COVID-19 epidemic, which has seen learning centres having to close. 
and also um, more remote teaching. And at the time of recording this, which is in June um, in 2020, it looks very much like when students start in September, um, teaching may be very, very different. How may that look, Molly? Well, I think we've learned a lot of lessons over the last few months. We've been working with our centres to um, help them adapt to remote methods of teaching and learning. And actually, the majority of centres have done that really successfully. Um, so I think as, as we go forward through the summer and start thinking about new courses starting in September, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty around um, what that's going to look like. Um, tutors and centres and students alike are considering different options for um, new courses and, and how they're going to be able to continue their studies. Um, what I think is probably fairly safe to assume is that um, it's not going to look the same as it did before this pandemic. Um, not everyone will be able to return to the classroom. Um, some students or tutors may be still isolating. And even where um, groups are able to return, it's likely that there's still going to be some social distancing rules in place. So we've been talking to centres to begin to sort of map out what that might look like for them. And there's quite a few um, different options that are available. One, of course, if it's not possible to return, is to continue with the remote teaching and learning that they've set up now and that many students have been engaging with uh, really successfully, even though there's been many, many challenges. Um, but um, some of those remote methods, I think, are probably going to remain in place. So um, it's likely that we're going to see some sort of blended uh, version of counselling training in the future certainly for many people. Yes, and I think that this is re really interesting because training should always reflect the world that, that people are going to go into. So traditionally, counselling training would have been people practising their skills, sat in front of each other in seats in a room. Um, but the world that we're moving into is going to be more of an online world. I think that everybody who's an observer of counselling, certainly in the UK and from what I can pick up for most of the world, is realising now that online will be a significant um, element in counselling. And I know colleagues in charities are looking at making sure that they offer a blended uh, option to clients. In fact, practising practitioners are offering a blended approach. Some may dip, go back to face-to-face, -face. others may work online. So it's, it's really essential, isn't it, that students get vicariously the the skills to be able to work technology and be able to work online so this is going to be really really useful i think isn't it um for the world we're it, going into absolutely right rory it is indeed um despite the the challenges and the difficulties that students have faced in adapting to online work um those students who are in placements have many of them have been able to um, undertake some additional training um, and continue seeing clients remotely. Um, alongside that, tutors have been helping students to develop those skills um, either through their own delivery or, as you say, actually by developing those skills in their learning. So they've been learning um, how it is to work with somebody remotely through their counselling skills practice, for example. They've been learning how to, you know, simple things like use technology effectively to make sure that those interactions are safe and contained. So although this year has been incredibly difficult, the students studying now are in a prime position to move forward into the new world of counselling and psychotherapy. They're probably better equipped than most experienced counsellors, to be honest. Y yes, and of course, that's that's going to that's going to uh, feed into things like employability, um, yeah. because you know if, if you are an experienced online counsellor through your you know your training practice, then that has to be mighty appealing, maybe to um, an employer because these are the kind of skills that we got that the counseling is going to need and of course there's one other crucial factor here clients 
clients are now going to want online therapy. There are those who may be shielding, self-isolating. It's very possible that some charities may look at economies of scale and say, it's impossible to do social distancing. You know, they, they tend to, some charities tend to have, you know, uh, very uh, kind of compact rooms. They're making the most of their money and they may look at it and say, it's just impossible to social distance. It may have to go online. So in the service of the client, actually the blended learning is really important. Absolutely. And all our work has the client at the heart of it, as you say, and what we're hearing from students um, is that their centres are already considering these things. So they can see that their offer um, is much wider, that this has really widened access to counselling for many clients. Um, and many clients um, find a remote online service really, really beneficial and suits their particular circumstances much better. So as you say, counsellors who are um, newly qualified counsellors who are in training and working in placements are absolutely um, at the heart of this sort of new movement and will be able to make very good use of those skills. Um, we, we've heard already from students who are completing a diploma course this year that their agencies more than ever want them to stay on um, in that agency and continue doing the work that they've been doing. Yeah, so this this is a real opportunity, isn't it? Because uh, the counselling world has changed and maybe the skills that we would usually put great stock into aren't the skills that now are now needed in the world we're living. And uh, the online world, be it use of telephone, um, video, the, you know, either of those, they're really, really important. So it's a great opportunity, really, isn't it? And, and CPCAB are at the heart of this because... It, you know, talking to yourself and other colleagues at CPCAB, it feels like you've really embraced this change and, and are, are kind of moving forward with it with uh, gusto. Well, absolutely. And CPCAB um, have always had research at the heart of uh, the work that we do, the services that we provide. So we're uh, most interested in keeping in line with what's happening. We recognise that the world is changing in counselling and psychotherapy. And whilst we're in no means saying that, you know, we're going to move completely to a, an online remote way of working, we recognise that it's um, the, the, the benefits and advantages for many, many people. And we recognise that our students need those skills more than ever. We will be adding some new guidance, actually, into the Level 4 Diploma course around um, developing online and telephone counselling skills and helping students to um, really understand some of the new um, context of that. So thinking about uh, connection and presence uh, when, when they're working online, as well as all the practical and safety aspects of that. But there's a lot of research that shows that actually presence and connection doesn't have to be compromised when you're working online. Yes, and, and as you say, CPCAB um, put research at the heart of qualifications and the, the research is, is pointing generally to the fact that you can have high-quality relationships online as you can face-to-face. -face. And I'm reminded of Carl Rogers, of course, who talks about the people of tomorrow, and of course, this is tomorrow. We we are we are moving into a new a new direction, and uh, skilling up counsellors for what will be uh, the new world. It, it it seems very very exciting, very very exciting indeed, uh, Molly. It does, doesn't it? And and as we sort of move into that new world and through into the next academic year, with students who are continuing in their studies there's certain to be um, a blended style of delivery for all the reasons that we've been talking about today. And those are all in themselves opportunities to develop these skills, as well as the additional training that we may be able to um, access as well. So Molly, thank you so much for joining us today. You've given us a snapshot into the new exciting world of online training, driven by research, driven by passion for the client, and also to equip students for what will be um, a digital revolution. 
in counselling. You know, let's not underestimate this is a massive step change and uh, CPCAB are at the heart of that. So, Moliere, thank you very much. Check-in with CPCAB is proudly sponsored by CPCAB, the only awarding body run by counsellors for counsellors. To learn more about CPCAB qualifications and to get more detailed information on today's podcast topic, visit cpcab.co.uk. There you have it, Ken. Blended mixed delivery of classroom and online um, online teaching. And I think, I think it's very apt because I think that any council education should mirror what society is where society is at this present time. And it's almost certain that there's going to be more online counselling than ever before. So I think it's really good that students are are learning for some of their um, l- lessons online to get used to the technology, get used to the environment that they'll be counselling in. And um, I welcome it. I think that uh, we're going to have a lot of digital-ready practitioners um, at the end of courses who can engage with clients um, in in the real world, which will be, I think, a predominantly digital one. Indeed, and, and it's kind of very much a focus from our side here at Counselling Tutors. We, we feel that uh, we are part of leading this digital rev- revolution into what the future is. And, and there's a saying that the future is now, you know, that, that <laughs> COVID, uh, as you've just mentioned, Rory, has just sped things up so quickly. So many businesses, individuals, organizations have had to pivot in, in, at great speed and, and kind of been catapulted into the future. And it leads us beautifully into our next topic, which is uh, practice matters, where we look at elements that may present in a practice uh, room. And today we're speaking about a bit of technology, and that is the telephone. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's specifically about how you handle an abusive call. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. I was at a conference in uh, in 2019, and over lunch I was speaking with colleagues, and uh, one of the colleagues was saying, oh, I had a, a phone call um, from uh, a client or a, someone who was uh, asking to be a potential client who was talk, talking about very sexually charged content, and it turned out um, the, the, the kind of questions that the therapist was being asked were really um, not therapeutic questions, but more um, a kind of fetish um, questionnaire, if you like. And um, eventually the therapist had to put the phone down. What was really interesting was that um, the type of thing being discussed, and I'm, I'm being quite careful here because I know that little ears listen to uh, our podcast, is, is that um, there were specific things that were being asked the therapist to do, shall we say. And um, three or four other people at the table said, oh, I've had that person phone me up. And um, it's, it, is, it is really not unusual. And I think if you're an independent therapist, um, you really need to prepare yourself for that. It's not the norm, I have to say, but it can happen. And um, I think it can be quite alarming. I know I've supervised people who've had these phone calls. It can be alarming. Are they going to come around to my house? Are they going to hurt me? Um, and the answer is, um, I would say, the, the likelihood of someone actually actually appearing at your house is very, very short small um usually people who do this behavior do it over the phone because they cannot be seen um and we need to be thoughtful of it and and a few years ago i got a phone call it's not just abusive phone calls it's phone calls that really need a lot of thinking about i had a phone call from someone who said they were being held hostage um in in, yeah in their in their own home it was it was an older person who were being held hostage and could have helped them Um, so i of course um, spoke with uh, the authorities and it turned out that the person who was phoning up had um, Alzheimer's and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah and and they they I don't know how they managed to find my website but they fo- they phoned up and um, at the time the, the police investigated they were um, they were in hospital um, and I've had one or two phone calls of that kind of ilk through the years um, so I think it's I think it's really important that if you're a private practitioner and it, it's one of those big steps. If you're working in an agency, then all of all the calls are screened by colleagues and all the assessments done by colleagues, and then you see the kind of filtered 
um, person who comes through. You know, they've been checked that therapy is okay for them, that it's therapy they want, and and they're appropriate for, for to see you. When you go into the professional world on your own, you're doing all that for yourself, and you will find that if you deal with the general public, occasionally you'll get quite unnerving or difficult phone calls. And it's really important that you have some sort of strategy in place to to deal with that and to um, to make sure that you feel protected. Um, and it's, it's just, just a, a part of the podcast to alert people that this can happen. Um, you ask any therapist, any female therapist, I have to say, um, sadly, who's been practicing long enough, and, and most of them will have had some form of um, abusive or odd phone call. Yeah, and <clears throat> it, it, the, the topic... I think needs to be spoken about and we speak again and again about continuing professional development being more than just learning about another client presentation and this is CPD just taking some time to think and reflect uh, about what what would I do in a situation if somebody phoned up and and it can be somebody inquiring about therapy it can be a a, a client that you may have been seeing that is angry for some reason and, and they are, are verbally abusive over, over the telephone for you or even via an email how might you work with that uh, and I guess within the heat of the moment it's very difficult uh, because of our brain chemistry we kind of get caught almost like rabbits in, in, in the headlights uh, um, their uh, hormones and, and chemicals come rushing into our brain and it takes away our ability to think um, I guess um, it, it, rationally and make informed decisions within the heat of the moment. So taking time to think what I might do in this situation uh, is definitely, I guess, uh, worth spending a little bit of time on. Maybe journal about it. It's a great conversational topic to speak about in our Facebook group already. Rory's already given you the the, the link to that. And uh, w- when the topic first came up and Rory and I were discussing it just pre-going into our session, I kind of thought about it and I thought, you know what, I don't think I've had... Uh, a a phone call like that but just that having the conversation has kind of dislodged a memory Rory like a little leaf has floated down (laughs) and uh, yeah I I had a I I worked in um, drug and alcohol services for some some years and during that time I had a number of abusive phone calls from service users who had had uh, well it sounded like and I, I guess I can't be sure sounded like they may have been using uh, that uh, decided to to call the service with, <laughs> with with their disgruntlement and anger at the time, and and I was on the the receiving end of that. And I guess one of the things that we can do uh, in terms of a, a strategy is listen, uh, it, it, or get off the phone if it, if it is an inappropriate, as as the, the the first ones that you were talking about, Rory. Yeah. Uh, but responding is what we kind of want to avoid in this situation. Absolutely. We need to give everybody a chance. You know, it may be that that you, you get clients who are struggling with quite, and I use the term kind of precisely here, bizarre um, difficulties, fetishists um, who may want to get out of a pattern of behaviour. And they may, they may be, t- you know, we know about disinhibition effects on the phone. People tend to overshare um, over, the, over the phone. Um, and it may be they they tell you that they're, they're struggling with a particular kind of um, behaviour, and they may they may genuinely need help. So we shouldn't dismiss that. Um, but usually you can tell by the flavour of the conversation as it goes on. Um, it goes more from needing help to needing, shall we say, another service. And at that point, you need to have a strategy to disengage. And if it becomes quite difficult, um, obviously most phone numbers now can be logged. You know, you can, if it's, if it is an abusive phone call, contact the police and they, they should follow that up. I have to say that it doesn't happen a lot. I, I don't want to give people the, you know, go to go to bed tonight, worried that the next phone call from a client is going to be an abusive one. Um, but you have to prepare for it. If you're working with the general public, then the general public will come to you in all their forms. So, so just be mindful and um, if it does happen, seek support from your supervisor and try not to overly worry about it. The, the instances of um, people actually turning up at someone's house or stalking them is, is, is not as prevalent as people might think. 
the, the phone is usually used because, you know, people can't see who they are. Well, thank you, Rory, for raising that important topic, getting us to think about it and uh, consider what we might do in that moment. What an episode. It has. We started off with training with a difficult past, and there's a handout for that. Um, we checked in with Molly Air from CPCAB, who gave us a insight into what new counselling training will look like. Really exciting um, training for a new digital world. And the outro is handling abusive or, shall we say, odd phone calls. And as always, stay grounded, stay safe, and take look after each other. If you're a qualified counsellor or psychotherapist, then why not check out the Counsellor CPD Library. Stay current with your CPD requirements with over 150 hours of academically rigorous, on-demand lectures you can stream to your device. Joining Counsellor CPD will expand your skill set to create a more specialised, highly rewarding practice. For more information on the Counsellor CPD Library, visit counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counsellingtutor.com.